Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you know about my second or technically third channel called Thinkology. If you like slightly shorter content than my main episodes from time to time where maybe everything is not so depressing or sad or in general, just want a change of pace of content from time to time, then check out Thinkology. While I am not voicing on it, I have sourced some amazing talent to bring this new channel to life. The channel covers history on Mondays, creepy spooky things on Tuesdays, nature on Wednesdays, crime on Thursdays, and trivia on on Fridays. So if any of that interests you, make sure to check out the link in the description box or check out Thinkology on YouTube. Vegas was built by mobsters. We've all heard that. It's common knowledge for many, but did you know it was also built by a Mormon mafia? I'm not kidding. The history of Las Vegas isn't as straightforward as you might think. Perhaps it's no surprise that casinos have a shady history, but what happens in Vegas isn't about to stay in Vegas. So let's take a look behind the cover and see what we can find. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Prism of the Past. Today, we're going to talk about Las Vegas, how it was created, and what led to it becoming such a famous and infamous city. Of course, I can't possibly discuss every single detail about Vegas in today's episode, but we'll definitely discuss some of the things I found most interesting. So let's just jump right into it. Now, Las Vegas was founded by ranchers and railroad workers back in the 1800s. The Paiute tribe were in the area as early as 700 AD, but the first person of European ancestry to enter the Las Vegas Valley was Rafael Riviera in 1821. He named it Las Vegas, meaning the meadows, because of the spring watered grasses. A few decades later in 1855, Mormons were told by church president Brigham Young to settle on the land and establish some sort of halfway station for travelers, right between Salt Lake City and the Pacific coast. After all, there were already Mormon settlements in Southern Utah and Southern California. So being right between the two seemed like a pretty decent idea. This did not last more than a couple years though. Between disagreements among groups leadership and failed crops, the settlement failed, as did their attempts to convert the Paiutes that lived there. Other sources claim it was Native American raids that really pushed the Mormons out of the area. But either way, the point is that Las Vegas was quiet once again, and the Paiutes didn't really have to deal with many outsiders for a while. Sky History claims there was one widow that set up the Las Vegas Ranch, a place for travelers to rest, but otherwise there wasn't really any activity for about half a century. In 1905, things changed. Las Vegas was officially founded as a city on May 15th of that year, when 110 acres of land were auctioned off by a railroad company. According to the Las Vegas website, the completion of San Pedro, Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad, linking Southern California with Salt Lake City, established Las Vegas as a railroad town. It was an ideal refueling and rest stop. And on June 1st, 1911, Las Vegas became incorporated into Clark County, Nevada. The Paiute's free movement and traditional way of life ended. And as one source puts it, they became landless laborers in their own land. More people began to settle there throughout the early 1900s as schools were built. And funnily enough, gambling was actually outlawed. In the early days, gambling wasn't allowed in Vegas, whereas now it's become so well known for that very thing. Instead, at this point, Vegas was a railroad town and Senator William Clark, who Clark County was named after, was even looking at other assets. Francis Smith, also known as the Borax King, was also in the railroad industry. He and Clark had an agreement to join forces when they made the Tanaupa and Tidewater Railroad. But Clark broke their agreements, instead creating the Las Vegas and Tanaupa Railroad, a rival company to try and tap into multiple gold mines. Clark was honestly a pretty shady guy, and that's not even touching on the fact that he was actually part of the Confederacy. Apparently he deserted them and just got into mining, but according to my source. In 1899, when US senators were still chosen by state legislatures instead of by general election, Clark was caught trying to bribe Montana legislators with $30,000 to elect him to the Senate, a practice not considered unusual for the time. Clark said to have used $1,000 bills in his bribery attempt once quipped, I've never bought a man who wasn't for sale. The Montana legislature finally elected Clark to the Senate in 1901, but much of his attention remained on his business affairs. 
From 1902 to 1904, Clark clashed with the Union Pacific Railroad for rights of way into Las Vegas, finally agreeing to sell a share in his railroad to his competitor in 1904. After Clark established the railroad in 1905, his line cut the travel time from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles to only one day. He ran spurs north to other parts of Nevada. He continued to operate the line with his brother and Union Pacific Railroad Chief E.H. Harriman until Union Pacific bought it outright in 1921, making Clark even richer. After Las Vegas was established, Clark had little to do with it. Instead, Las Vegas was actually known for illicit gambling taking place. So, you know, so much for the ban, right? As well as some of their quickie divorces. Divorce in the early 1900s was an extremely difficult task. There was a divorce revolution in the 60s, but before then it was questionable, frustrating, and unusual. Apparently in Great Britain, there were only 1000 divorces a year around that time. From the 1910s to the 1920s, the divorce rate almost doubled in the US from 4.5 to 7.7 out of every 1000 residents. The gold digger trope also emerged around this time period, which really didn't help matters. Las Vegas, however, was like a breath of fresh air by comparison to other attitudes surrounding divorce. Six weeks after residency, a quickie divorce could be obtained there. So residents would stay at Duke ranches, working ranches that took in guests that needed to make ends meet for six weeks until they could legally separate. Some sources claim that Nevada did this as well as setting up brothels to counter their inhospitable climate and terrain to encourage settlers. Though the residency requirement wasn't initially this brief, it was never nearly as long as other states. Of course, the real massive changes that shaped Nevada didn't really take place until the 30s. In 1931, gambling was legalized and construction began on the Boulder Dam, later renamed the Hoover Dam. A 1931 Time article described the little desert town as swelling like a toadstool and also made mention of the fact that speakeasies flourished because Nevada didn't have any dry law set in place. Nightclubs, real estate, gambling resorts, Las Vegas started to boom for the things we've come to know it for today. Of course, you'd think people would be thrilled because this was a great economic boom, even during the Great Depression, but not everyone was too keen about how Vegas was going about gaining this business. According to Time, all this growth and commotion at Las Vegas and federal government eyed with stern disfavor. It was decided that Hoover Dam shall be built in a moral atmosphere. Therefore, from Washington last week went forth secret orders, which sent half a hundred prohibition agents under Colonel George Seavers of San Francisco swooping down upon Las Vegas. 25 nightclubs, saloons, and roadhouses were raided. Lakes of liquor were seized, five breweries put out of commission. Fire threatened the business district when enthusiastic agents ignited a great stack of mash barrels. Arrested were 80 bootleggers, bartenders, speakeasy proprietors, girl entertainers. After a 12 hour cleanup, Las Vegas was reported to be as dry as a surrounding sage bush. Declared Colonel Seavers, we're going to make this place safe for Hoover Dam workers. After this, a Michigan Congressman and ardent prohibitor appointed by the Secretary of the Interior decided that Hoover Dam workmen would live in Boulder City instead and Vegas would be where they spend their money and playtime. Once the dam was complete, it provided Las Vegas with water and electric power, making it all more viable as a city. And around World War II, Vegas only grew further. Now, instead of dam builders, it was defense workers and military personnel that flooded the city and spent their hard earned dollars at the casinos and nightclubs. Nevada Senator Pat McCarran was in large part responsible for this. He lobbied the government to establish two major installations near Vegas in 1941. The first was a magnesium processing plant southeast and the second was a military airfield to the northeast. To meet the newcomer's needs, the El Rancho Vegas Resort opened up on a section of US 91 highway, becoming the first hotel open on what would later become known as the Strip. Many of the hotel casinos that followed on the Strip followed a regional or Old West theme. Growth was rapid. The city's population almost tripled between 1940 and 1950. However, legal gambling and sex work was incredibly attractive for the workers as well as organized crime. Bugsy Siegel is one of the most infamous Las Vegas criminals from this time period. He opened up one of the first major casino and hotel complexes in the city known as the Flamingo in 1946. He's been called the man who invented Las Vegas, even though that's not entirely true. After all, the Flamingo wasn't the first casino on the strip, El Rancho was. Bugsy's was just the first to have a more cosmopolitan style. Hell, the Flamingo wasn't even successful at first. It lost $300,000 in the first week of operation. 
And keep in mind, that's not accounting for inflation. So not to mention the flamingo wasn't Bugsy's idea either. Billy Wilkerson, owner of The Hollywood Reporter, was actually the one that tried to create this European style hotel with luxurious rooms on the strip and Bugsy and his partners just invested in it. Apparently, Bugsy and his partners in crime used profits from the sale of a different hotel to influence Wilkerson to accept new partners. The Flamingo clearly wasn't what people were looking for on the strip though, and it closed down only two weeks after opening. It reopened in March of 1947 and Bugsy forced Wilkerson out of the resort so it could report a profit. Not that this really did Bugsy any good because in June of that year, his partners allegedly had him killed because they believed Bugsy wasn't giving them a square count or an honest financial report. The crime remains unsolved and that's what's widely accepted for that version of events anyway. Of course, it's not just Bugsy. According to one article in the LA Times, Las Vegas was built by quite a bit of gangsters during this time period. They write, the slogan, what happens here stays here, promised a good time, but the wink and the nod was always more insidious. Las Vegas, a town built by organized crime, abetted by violence, run by corrupt officials. It's very roads and streets like a map to secret criminal behavior. Flamingo Road runs parallel to Sands Avenue, which runs parallel to Desert Inn Road and on and on. All of them running parallel to the criminals who paved them in the first place. Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, Mo Dalitz. You know their names because Omerta, a cult of silence, was never really a thing. No secrets are ever kept. No one ever stays quiet. But also because we started writing books and making movies about these guys, turning Las Vegas into the ultimate tourist cosplay experience long before cosplay was a word. Locals started talking about how the place was better when the mob was in charge. And in Mario Puzo's The Godfather, Bugsy Siegel was turned into Mo Green and we all became Fredo, silk shirts and bad behavior. Meyer Lansky is right up there in notoriety with Bugsy. The two of them worked together to oversee the construction process of the Flamingo. The Flamingo was just the first of many mob finance projects or one that benefited from the mob at least. Others like the Desert Inn and Thunderbird also ushered in a profitable business for mobsters under Nevada law. Hell, when things in Vegas are difficult, people will sometimes regurgitate the cliche Vegas phrase, things were better when the mob ran this town. One of the reasons being that those in charge, casino executives that is, were part of the community. Now, casino executives can live elsewhere and spend their days globetrotting. According to journalist J. Patrick Kulikin, America has always had a fascination with outlaws and Las Vegas residents got to live among them. They were certainly more colorful people, Sloan, a gaming lawyer said, employing his rich skill with a euphemism. And they gave back. Mo Dalitz and partners famously built with a Teamsters loan, Sunrise Hospital. Nevada historian, Michael Green also noted Dalitz gave UNLV money for the first furniture in the building. Sloan recalled stories of casino operators generously paying hospital bills for the sick children of employees. I should note, of course, that many casino operators in Old Vegas were not mob connected and those that were unfairly tarnished the entire city. Although there were definitely mob connected owners in Vegas and the phrase, the mob ran Vegas isn't completely wrong, I wouldn't say it's completely accurate either. Even so, there's no denying the massive impact the mob had during these early Vegas days. Naturally, given how prevalent mobsters were in Vegas, there were some that weren't too happy about this. Namely, President John F. Kennedy's younger brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy believed gambling was the lifeblood of organized crime. So to throttle organized crime, he wanted to go after casinos, said David Schwartz, director of UNLV's Gaming Research Center. Schwartz also claimed that this anti-mob campaign consisting of massive raids and wiretapping was flawed from the start because people were more afraid of mob bosses than the Justice Department. State officials would claim that casinos were well-regulated, but the US Senate Special Committee on Organized Crime in Interstate Commerce weren't so sure. Their investigation from 1951 to 1952 found that the licensing procedures there didn't regulate, reform, or remove these mobsters, but just gave them a quote, cloak of respectability, end quote. Another one of Robert Kennedy's strategies to uncover the illegal activity in the casinos was for the Department of Justice to partner up with the IRS. If they couldn't catch these mobsters for their shady dealings, then they'd go after them by tracking mob money skimmed by the casinos. In other words, these were casino winnings diverted to avoid taxes. So these mobsters would be prosecuted for tax fraud instead. The same strategy used on Al Capone. The Teamsters Union, one of the largest and most diverse unions in the state and known for championing freight drivers and warehouse workers was tied to this as well. The Teamsters Pension Fund was a virtual mob front being used to build up Vegas while state officials did little to nothing. The New York Times later reported. 
In the 1960s and 1970s, the Teamsters' huge central states pension fund was a wellspring of union corruption. Tens of millions of dollars were loaned to racketeers who used the money to gain control of Las Vegas casinos. Administrative jobs were awarded to favored insiders who paid themselves big fees. A former Teamster president and pension trustee was convicted of trying to bribe a United States Senator. Robert Kennedy even believed that organized gambling was not just a problem, but the biggest crime problem the country had, as according to him, it financed almost all other operations. The mob had become a national syndicate and the federal government was stepping in, despite organized crime being almost an entirely new concept for them. Of course, the entire tangled web involving Kennedy going after the mob is one that I can't tackle in full today. But I do highly recommend you check out a lecture from the Mob Museum if you wanna dive deeper into that entire mess. And they'll be linked in my sources below. Which by the way, if you do go to Las Vegas, the Mob Museum is an absolute stop. I try to go there every time I go to Vegas and I feel like I learn something new every time. But the point of this all is that by the fall of 1963, Robert was ready to strike. He had laid out plans for a massive frontal assault on Nevada itself, and all the investigative resources from the FBI to the IRS would be enlisted. Then, just a few short weeks later, his older brother, President Kennedy, was assassinated, according to my source. A few days after the assassination, a Chicago mobster was heard on a federal wiretap telling Nevada crime figure Sam Giancana, in another two months from now, the FBI will be like it was five years ago. So it was. Hoover stopped reporting to RFK and informed an independent relationship with the new president, Lyndon Johnson. The FBI now would do about the mob only what Hoover allowed it to do. This is why the idea that the mob assassinated JFK still persists to this day, even if we simply don't have the evidence to prove it. Thousands of pages of electronic surveillance of organized crime leaders have been gone through and there's nothing there to suggest their involvement. Still, JFK's death did benefit them. There's no doubt about that. Robert didn't have his brother as a connection anymore and the Nevada project died out. RFK had been so vehemently against organized crime and though it remained national policy to stamp out the mob, the principal driver was gone. By the time the 70s and 80s rolled around, the mob extended its power beyond the strip. Anthony Spilautro, known as Tony the Ant, came to Vegas in 1971 to run a gift shop. However, state regulators learned he had been allegedly involved in as many as 20 murders. Tony formed a hole in the wall burglary gang, earning its nickname after blowing a hole in the side of a jewelry store during a robbery, something like straight out of a cartoon. And just like that, the mob had been romanticized or at least glamorized in Vegas. Sure, the movies and the larger than life characters are fascinating, but I'm not so sure I'm really longing for the days when the mob was in control either. However, it wasn't just mobs supposedly running Vegas either. One source claims that other casinos in Riviera, New Frontier, and Strip Dunes were developed using illegal money from both Wall Street banks and even the Mormon church. Ashley Hall, the church's public affairs director said that, quote, you can raise the question of how can good Mormons be involved indirectly in gaming? But to us, business is business. Gaming is not illegal in Nevada, end quote. And it's true, the LDS community has played a massive role in Las Vegas, despite the church officially opposing gaming. Still banker Perry Thomas, a Mormon whose wife is a direct descendant of the famed Brigham Young, financed dozens of casinos in the 50s. He apparently worked with Teamsters leader, Jimmy Hoffa to finance some casinos using union pension funds in the 60s, as well as at one point owned the Riviera Hotel Casino. When Thomas was asked about the apparent conflict between his religious principles and his involvement in gambling, he said that before starting to finance the casino industry, he struggled with the moral imperative. Should we extend credit? Should we do business? Should we accept deposits? Should we be in any way involved with gamblers, these dirty, filthy gamblers? Thomas recounted in the BBC's 1998 documentary, Las Vegas and the Mormons. Well, it finally dawned on us that in Nevada, gaming was legal. And as bankers, we were entitled to support every legal entity. But it wasn't just mobsters and criminals that were attracted to Vegas, nor was it just Mormons deciding to separate business from religion. Either one of those might be a bit strange or interesting. Instead, combine the two. The Mormon mafia helped shape Vegas. Now that's a sentence I thought I'd never utter. And before we dig into this supposed Mormon mafia, we're just going to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor. 
It's never too early to start gift shopping for the holidays, especially because today you can save big on a gift that they will use every day, Raycon wireless earbuds. And I use Raycons for practically everything in my life now. I even have two pairs. I keep one in my car for when I'm doing like grocery shopping or like going to Target and I don't wanna hear or deal with people. And then I keep another pair by Casper's Leash so when we go on walks together, I can listen to music. With seamless Bluetooth pairing and a comfortable noise isolating fit, you can start listening right away and keep listening for hours. The audio quality is amazing and it's comparable to what you would get with other premium brands, except Raycon starts at half the price. Raycon offers eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. There's also a built-in mic so you can take calls on your earbuds at the press of a button. So this holiday season, get them something they actually will use for calls or music, for work or play at home or on the go. Go to buyraycon.com prism today to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. But hurry because this offer is available for a limited time only and you don't want to miss it. That's buyraycon.com prism to unlock up to 20% off your Raycons. Buyraycon.com prism. If you're looking for ways to skip the trip to the post office and dodge all the hectic holiday shopping traffic, then why not save time and money with stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. Stamps.com is actually the service I'm going to be using when it's time for me to send out my little paw prints from Casper letters for my Patreon. It's super easy. I can print all the labels out at home and simply drop everything off and that's it. I'm good to go. I do all my prep work at home with stamps and then that's it, I'm good. Whether you're selling online or running an office or a side hustle, stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress, especially during the holiday season. And you can get discounts you can't find anywhere else, up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. So save time and money this holiday season with stamps.com. Sign up using promo code PRISM for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage, and a digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code PRISM. Perry Thomas was not acting alone or even on his own behalf really when he was buying up these casinos. Instead, it was actually a wealthy billionaire named Howard Hughes that created the so-called Mormon mafia when he moved to Vegas. Howard Hughes's father, Howard Hughes Sr., patented a drill bit that transformed the oil industry. Hughes Jr. was deemed one of the greatest businessmen in history, despite suffering plenty of failures at the time. By the 1960s, Hughes was older, suffering from narcotics addictions, and he'd become a hermit, never even leaving his room. He would negotiate purchases and deals from his bedroom with the curtains drawn and windows and doors sealed shut with tape. In 1967, a year after occupying the top floor rooms at the Desert Inn Hotel in Vegas, the co-owner Mo Dalitz told Hughes he needed to move out because he and his entourage were occupying valuable rooms. To shut him up, Hughes bought the hotel. And this, as ridiculous as it sounds, made Hughes realize the potential for profit these hotels and casinos along the Strip had, and he wanted more. It was like a game to Hughes. He literally referred to the Vegas casinos as toys and spent almost $200,000 a day on land and casinos. And remember, this is not accounting for inflation. This is absolutely stupid money that he had. And while guests were gambling away on the machines, Hughes was spending his golden years treating Vegas itself like his own gambling addiction paradise. On the other hand, some sources say that Hughes wasn't exactly what you'd speculate from an ordinary businessman and he wasn't just a recluse. Apparently he never trimmed his nails and kept his urine in jars. If he fell asleep during a movie on television, he would literally call up the television station and have them play the film again from the beginning. He apparently just sat in his room all day, four years, butt naked. It's speculated that he had a serious mental illness, which is depicted in the movie, The Aviator. BBC said that he did have OCD, leading Hughes to burn his entire wardrobe if he thought there were too many germs on them and he'd wash his hands to the point of bleeding, but not much else is known about what was going on in his personal life, so I don't plan on speculating much. Needless to say, Hughes was certainly a character that many to this day find fascinating. Regardless of his strange or unusual behavior, Hughes needed someone to handle business for him, right? Well, who better than the Mormons? Even though as far as we know, Hughes was not a Mormon, almost everyone he employed was. His aides, nurses, secretaries, companions, and cooks, many of them were Mormons. He did this because he believed Mormons had high moral standards. They don't drink, gamble, or smoke, so they seemed like trustworthy businessmen. One of these was, of course, banker Perry Thomas. 
They were incredibly close to the point where Hughes wouldn't make any major purchase decisions without consulting him. Hughes's right-hand man, Frank William Gay, more commonly known as Bill, was also a Mormon from Salt Lake City. And I mean, you can hire whoever you want. And if Hughes believed Mormons were more trustworthy, then that is totally up to him. I just find it interesting that because of him, the term Mormon mafia arose and Las Vegas for a time was essentially run by Mormons and mobsters. When Hughes died in 1976, his connection to the Mormon community was so extensive that his will became known as the Mormon will. It still hasn't been found to this day and Hughes apparently didn't leave one, but speculation arose that he might've left a handwritten one and this was the name given to it. One attorney said that Hughes had once asked him about the legality of such a will, so it didn't seem completely out of the question. The Mormon will has become somewhat of a legend, a forgery, and an interesting case in of itself. But back to Vegas, Perry Thomas didn't just work with Hughes. In the 60s, many casino owners had gotten old and were ready to sell. Thomas, who was snatching them up for Hughes' sake, was in the market to buy. However, Nevada law at that time required owners to be licensed and corporations weren't allowed to own any since it wouldn't be practical for every single stockholder to have a license. Some thought corporate control would open the industry to hidden ownership. Just the opposite was true, Perry Thomas said. He proposed changing the law in 1965. Northern Nevada controlled the legislature and Bill Hara of Harris Casinos figured he didn't need investors on Wall Street. He persuaded legislators to kill the bill, Thomas said. So Thomas urged Hera and his attorney, Mead Dixon, to join him in supporting the bill. Otherwise, what was Hera's company going to do when he died? Dixon understood immediately. He convinced Bill Hera it was the proper thing to do, Thomas said. The bill became law in 1967 and was refined with a 1969 amendment. Since then, small investors have been allowed to buy shares of casino corporations without obtaining a gaming license. Only those holding 10% or more are required to be licensed. But why does that matter to us today? Well, even though this law shaped Vegas, it hurt Vegas to some extent too. Corporations owning resorts meant more massive luxurious resorts to draw in customers, which meant rapid population growth, which meant more crime, traffic, and anything else that comes with extremely fast growth, really. Another aspect of this is that as it turns out, Perry Thomas has mentored even modern well-known figures in Vegas. Steve Wynn, for example, knew Perry for 50 years and referred to him as dad because they were so close. And if you don't know who Steve Wynn is, he is of course, one of the most recognizable billionaires that's created some of Vegas's most notable casinos like the Mirage, Treasure Island, Bellagio, and of course the Wynn Las Vegas and Encore I think too. He also resigned from his company Wynn Resorts in 2018 after dozens of women accused him of sexual misconduct. So, you know, not exactly someone to look up to, but a powerful businessman nonetheless. For good or for bad though, there's no denying the effect that the Mormon community and those close to it have had on Las Vegas. But just as Las Vegas became well-known and boomed, there was another smaller city right beside it, West Las Vegas. See, back in the 1920s, segregation laws didn't exist in Vegas, but once tourism rose, the dam was completed and gambling was legalized, they were put into effect. In response, black people created their own Las Vegas with their own strip known as the Black Strip. Black people and Chinese immigrants owned clubs in this area, catering to those who weren't welcome in the white Vegas. Black people may have been allowed to work in the casinos in Vegas, but they couldn't attend shows, live in the casino district, or obtain or renew business licenses. The area ended up booming in the 40s and 50s, especially because black entertainers would party and relax at West Side clubs since they weren't permitted to actually stay in Vegas hotels, only perform there. Louis Armstrong, The Ink Spots, Ed Sullivan, Little Milton, Cab Calloway, Nat King Cole, Sammy David Jr. and Sonny Liston were all popular performers that could be seen in West Las Vegas up until desegregation. It wasn't actually until 1955 that the first integrated hotel casino in Vegas arrived, the Moulin Rouge. Dubbed the Vegas hotspot that broke all the rules by the Smithsonian, the Moulin Rouge seemed to have good timing. President Truman had abolished segregation in the US military seven years earlier, and the year previously, the Supreme Court did the same for schools. Slowly but surely, desegregation was spreading. It's not to say it was welcomed by all, and it wasn't a frustrating, tedious process, but it was happening all the same. Though some predicted the worst, it was largely a success. One black visitor from the South said, where I come from, that'd get you lynched when he saw interracial couples at a casino. Just the idea of racial mixing itself attracted sellout crowds as that in of itself was so unusual. 
Those that seemed to actually hate the Moulin Rouge were most usually the strip casino's owners, those who were upset that their showgirls were abandoning them for the West Side. They made a rule that any showgirls seen leaving for the Moulin Rouge would be fired, but this didn't stop them. Showgirls would hide in the back seats of cars and party behind the scenes, eating delicious food, singing and dancing, celebrating the Moulin Rouge. So then again, the question, why didn't this last? Well, one dancer, Jasmine, believes her bosses looted the place. Others blame the owners, the banks. Some blame the mobsters, management, the location, or just plain bad luck. Other resorts didn't hire the Rouge's black dancers and front of house workers. So while some found jobs as maids or dishwashers, many others left town. One dancer, Anna Bailey, says she couldn't get work. Even though she'd backed up legends like Cab Calloway, The Ink Spots, and Bill Bojangles Robinson, no Vegas showrunner would hire her. According to the Smithsonian, one night in the late 50s, she joined a group of black women going to see Sinatra at the Sands. A security guard stopped us, Bailey recalled. No blacks allowed, the guard said. And Frank Sinatra came and got us at the door. He walked us into the lounge and sat us down at his table. Sammy Davis Jr. had his head down. He was so embarrassed by what happened to us. I was just so proud walking behind Frank Sinatra and sitting down to his table. The Moulin Rouge became a motel, an apartment complex, and eventually burned down completely. Some say integration would have killed it eventually anyway, because as one filmmaker who documented the Moulin Rouge says, who needed an interracial hotel on the wrong side of the tracks once the sands and the trop are integrated? Still, the Moulin Rouge is a historic site to this day and a fascinating piece of Vegas history I found worth mentioning. So what about today? Does Las Vegas still have ties to the mob, to the Mormons? Well, it's been quite a while since the last casino in the city, Stardust, lost its license because of a skimming operation. Mobsters don't own the Vegas casinos these days. Although it's not as if all crime ended in the 80s, obviously. Now, mafia involvement seems to be concentrated in construction, food, beverage, the sex industry, garbage collection, and vending, but not really in Southern Nevada. The Italian mafia was apparently linked to the taxi business in Reno a few decades ago, but no ties have been uncovered in Vegas recently. Other sources say it depends on who you ask, and there are those who say mobsters do still have a hand in casino-related activities, but they've just taken a backseat to the action. Since corporations are allowed to own licenses and casinos, they've essentially become businessmen and they work for said company instead of handling the casinos as individuals. Now they allegedly partake in loan sharking, extortions, and burglaries as opposed to the more obvious mob activity back in the day. On the other hand, there's more evidence to point to the mafia no longer being in Vegas. According to this source, most casinos are now managed by large corporations and some foreign investors. And the intensive crackdown implemented by the gaming regulators, Las Vegas casinos and other gambling establishments simply cannot afford some tie up with the mob for fear of being intensely scrutinized and penalized. With efforts to promote Las Vegas as more of a family oriented vacation spot, the days of Vegas mobsters and mafia are gone. Even so, the mob, mafia, and even Mormon activities in Vegas have all shaped how Vegas functions today. Without Hughes hiring Perry and Perry, mentoring Wynn, and without mobsters creating some significant pieces of Vegas history, it could be a very, very different city, potentially unrecognizable from the Vegas we know today. But with all of that being said, I do hope that you found this deep dive into Las Vegas history interesting. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you for spending some of your time here with me today to learn a little bit about Las Vegas. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.